Um, really, really excited to uh, introduce our, our first guest of the semester, Ursula Kripa, who is a, a good friend and a, a fantastic, fantastic designer and researcher and scholar. And uh, may be familiar to quite a few of you because Ursula just reminded me, uh, last time she, we had her as a guest at this school was March of 2020, where we had a, uh, uh, what was the name of the event? I forgot, it was, uh, I forgot what it was, but it was, it was Anyways, it was a research-based thing. She was one of three speakers, and it was the first ever Zoom webinar we had ever done because it was we were about to have it, and then you guys know what happened in March 2020. Um, this thing happened, and we couldn't do it in person anymore, and we said, no, we're still going to do it, and we did it. I think we had like 500 people from around the world uh, check into this event because it was like the beginning, beginning of the whole pandemic, and I think people didn't know what to do with themselves. And, you know, they're like, well, let's watch webinars. Uh, so we, we had Ursula present. Uh, I've followed Ursula's career for a long time. In fact, when I set up my own practice, I remember I was trying to choose a name for my practice and I wanted to name agency. And I looked it up and I was like, damn it, it's taken. And, and she took it, beat me to it. Um, and I followed her career ever since. We've been fans of the work her and Stephen, her partner, have been doing. Um, then through the academic circles, got a chance to actually get to meet her and find out that she's just as nice or better of a person than she is as a designer and academic. And, and she's really, really amazing. Uh, Ursula is super decorated. She's won the Rome Prize. The, okay, I have a full list and I'm not reading it. So like, it's a very, very long list. It's, well, it's not here, but she's won like almost every award possible. Um, and she is the director of the School of Architecture at Texas Tech El Paso. I believe we have some former students here, some of her students both from uh, USC as well as SIAR, I believe are coming. Um, she's doing amazing work, working with uh, technology, uh, design and social political agency and, and thinking about how we can think about what we do as architects and as designers, as I, I would call, uh, you know, no pun intended, she has a book called Military Fronts as weapons to, to kind of point at social critical issues uh, that are affecting the world around us. And thinking about how design can't be something that has, no pun intended again, agency. So thank you very much, uh, Ursula. I'll, we'll leave it to you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, is my mic on? Can you hear me back there? No, can you hear me like this? Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. All right. So I have to um, press two buttons simultaneously with two different hands. So um, hi. So thank you all for being here, and um, thank you Doris for inviting me, and thank you Alvin for the really warm introduction. Um, I'm really excited to share some work um, today. Will be kind of um, shallow dives into several projects. Um, it's kind of a medley of types of projects we work on with, um, as Alvin mentioned, with my partner, Stephen Mueller and our research assistants. Um, the, the idea is so that um, to, our practice can make sense to you because if I describe one project um, in depth, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, we, we do many things. Um, so we are researchers, we're designers, um, and in those roles, we embrace confrontational roles to create objects, forms, spaces, databases and arguments which instrumentalize uh, spatial justice. So um, I will start with context and then each project is sort of labeled in relationship to that context. Um, we live here uh, on the US-Mexico border. I see Jerry here and some other students and Sergio, a former friend from El Paso. Um, so these guys are here to kind of make everything true, um, call me out. <laughs> But uh, this, this region is not defined by a border wall. Uh, we see it mostly as a series of sheds, uh, shared atmospheres, um, atmosphere, shared ecologies, uh, shared rights. So working in this kind of protracted, conflictual context, we work to shift the narrative, developing uh, specific methods to identify, appropriate, and subvert sub-perceptual urban and atmospheric events that violate human rights. This is the militarized landscape of the borderland and it's um, really our office and our reason for being there. This is our drive to work every day from home. Um, and we're there, we're there really to enact alternatives to this kind of damaging and divisive use of infrastructure. 
this is our daily commute, as I mentioned, um, and you can um, kind of see across the, the border that is, or across the fence that is Ciudad Juarez. Um, after the Secure Fence Act of 2006, 57 miles of border fence were completed here uh, by 2008, so in two years, mostly along the channelized uh, Rio Grande, uh, which you see here, kind of the mo most vegetated part of the desert. Um, and this serves also as the international boundary between Mexico and the US. You can see home in Ciudad Juarez, um, and you can also see the violence of infrastructure. There's a new highway, uh, the columns of which you see here, that straddles the border fence with parts of it on the south side of the fence and parts of it on the north side of the fence. Um, and kind of in this sort of no man's land between the fence and the river. So it's common to see border patrol agents uh, apprehend uh, migrants in this area. Um, and as migrants who, even if they make it past the fence, uh, they fed, face this impassable infrastructure landscape. And here on the left is the building where we work, which is a functioning uh, train station as well. So the idea of hacking an infrastructure and a kind of a, a live um, cohabitation is very much part of how we teach and we practice. Um, and yeah, the border fence and also rail um, is what goes through here, which was essentially developed as a, as a result of the NAFTA agreement to move product from the free economic zone and what is um, up north and through the coasts uh, around the world. So um, really quickly, some of you might have read these a few years ago. Uh, we, for about a year, we were publishing what we called border dispatches that were the series that um, we were using as a, as a quick kind of, um, not specifically architectural project, but as a really fast sort of photojournalistic essay to get some thoughts and frustrations out that take much less time than an architectural project would. So here we were closely tracking tracking changes in the in the built environment uh, in the US Mexico borderland since the um, a little bit before the Trump presidential election. So we documented the legally questionable expansion of identification protocols that were beyond the limits of the ports of entry and into international territory um, in order to reduce asylum claims and this practice continues today. Uh, we've documented the use of simulated border security infrastructures that you see here on the left to train operatives in lethal force. You see here bottom left, um, they're being trained to shoot through uh, the border fence, which is uh, illegal by international law. Uh, we've been able to reveal the role of the design and construction of industry and the construction industry in managing migrant bodies and destroying the environment at the same time. Um, and on the right, we've gained access to detention facilities to document their growing privatization and specialization. One of these investigative um, texts that I just wanted to quickly share revealed the growing number of construction technology, uh, specific, specifically through patents that were enabled as a result of the border wall prototypes. Um, so you may remember construction companies in 2017 constructed these mock-ups uh, in order to vie for the government contracts to install hundreds of miles of new border barriers. And so this is no news to all of you, um, but we did some digging uh, and found that many of these companies um, involved in these mock-ups were also applying for patents for the technology that they developed for the border wall. Um, a patent for a steel bollard fence design by Fisher Industries, um, which we uncovered, illustrated here, was piloted just outside of El Paso in the summer of 2019. Fisher Industries, um, I don't know if you watch Fox News, but they were showing up on Fox News often um, as a way to talk to uh, President Trump at the time uh, to convince him to give them this uh, the contract uh, for the National Border Fence Project because they had developed this, this patent. Um, so this since has enabled the rapid construction of miles of border wall uh, through environmentally sensitive areas, indigenous land, and is contributing to an ongoing lethal humanitarian crisis at the border as migrants continue to seek alternative paths through more dangerous and deadly terrain because of this new border fence. So here it is in El Paso. Um, this is a section of the border wall. It's under a mile long. Um, I think him and as you visited with your students, yeah. right? We saw this. Um, and so it was It was built within a few weeks with the patented technology. Um, the, and it was built without any environmental impact studies. 
uh, the construction disturbed polluted soil from um, from a, a close by former copper smelter, and all of that polluted soil made it into the river, um, the Rio Grande, shown here in the front of the image. Um, this is a problem for obvious reasons, but also because people depend on the river for drinking water and agricultural irrigation. So we've seen this technology continue to be deployed across borderlands uh, with damaging effects on ecologies, landscapes, and human life. Um, so the point of the article was not only to sort of uncover this idea of patenting, but also through that to caution our architectural and construction community to avoid using um, these new building techniques um, so that we're not tempted to kind of to invigorate these sort of technologies that were developed at such environmental and human cost. And so as a result of that work that we were, we were documenting, um, Amnesty called us uh, because the practice of Border Patrol agents uh, checking people before they entered a port, port of entry, before they could seek asylum, um, is obviously internationally illegal, but it wasn't being documented. So Amnesty found our photo um, and called us. And so since then, uh, we worked with them on sort of a few silent projects. And then this is one from 2020. Uh, it was really to visualize the dangerous overcrowding and mismanagement of federal and private immigration detention facilities, which has contributed to disproportionate rates of COVID-19 infections in this uh, vulnerable detained population. So using documents that Amnesty obtained from a freedom of information request, we were able to geolocate and categorize 200 federally operated immigration detention facilities in the U.S., and uh, visualizing um, their average detainee population and their actual capacity, which you see here in red, um, that is exaggerated, uh, it highlights those that are dangerously overcrowded. So there's an interactive uh, web map uh, of these facilities that summarizes the findings in, in graphic overlays, but uh, basically it provides searchable and zoomable facility level data in support of the Amnesty report. So in the online map, one can zoom in close enough and the layer of aerial images shows the physical properties and architecture of these buildings that you see here on the bottom right. Um, the overcrowding, as you know, is especially a problem in, in spreading COVID infections um, in this already sort of medically vulnerable um, immigrant population that has walked for, for thousands of miles. Um, and the report with, with the maps and the original photographs, and these are our photographs, um, advocated for the release of the migrants uh, while they're being processed so that they don't have to essentially um, spread COVID. Um, and so another, so what does that all mean? So moving, moving away from the kind of the context as these kind of quick photojournalistic essays, um, we are interested in the, the our con context and especially the transboundary context as a as a shed of shared um, kind of uh, qualities. So this one we'll talk about light. We're currently working on merging this kind of investigative territorial research with design research, which we are developing in post. Um, Post is a research center that Stephen and I co-direct at Texas Tech University, and it is a separate entity from, from agency, uh, but it's, it's led by us. And we focus on issues of urbanization and desertification um, as they hit the U.S.-Mexico border. So shifting patterns of ultraviolet exposure in North America map very closely to the international border with high intensities even in the winter months, intensifying at the southern boundary, as you see here. The 30th uh, degree parallel, which crosses the borderland, is therefore a charged exposure boundary. With the effects of climate change, populations below this boundary will see increased risk of sunburn and other negative health effects related to UV exposure. The lack of shade on the borderland um, in the landscape and the amount of atmospheric scattering from airborne dust creates the, uh, increases the health risk to, to specific individuals in this context. But at the same time, um, the national security apparatus has become expert at deploying tactical infrastructure that mitigates the impact of ultraviolet radiation on its agents in order to inspect and manage other bodies more efficiently. Do you see these infrastructures scattered along uh, across the landscape at border crossings? So building on these kinds of interventions, the federal border security apparatus has developed an appetite for shade, as you see, um, and has continued to invest in more permanent purpose-built structures to extend their cover and strengthen their position in the landscape, resulting in this kind of extensive uh, inventory of shade structures serving the security state. 
At a port of entry, shade is a national security concern. When screening technologies like license plate readers and radiation monitors are not protected by shade, they get overheated, obviously, and fail to operate. So uh, this draws concern and additional government oversight. Um, so although we understand shade um, across cities as an inequitable kind of material, um, here on the border, it really is about national security and equipment. Um, the highly securitized El Paso Ciudad Juarez Metroplex, is, which is our context, is one of the largest binational urban environments in the Western Hemisphere, where physiological effects of solar radiation are relentlessly rendered upon vulnerable populations. The Metroplex is host to some of the most traveled international pedestrian bridges between the US and Mexico, connecting the adjacent downtown areas. Um, this is a photo from a summer three years ago. Um, in a desert city subject to this kind of unparalleled geopolitical and environmental stress, Access to shade is uh, what has been described as an index of inequality by Sam Block. So migrants, asylum seekers, and detainees have been kept under makeshift shade structures beneath bridges for days at a time and exposed to UV damage while waiting to cross the border. So this is the condition. Um, and this is, uh, this again, this was another type of uh, context that I wanted to paint for you, this idea of, of UV and radiation in relationship to the desert um, and its militarization on the border. So irradiated shade is, is sort of the material we're working against here. So I'll show um, just a, a quick, uh, an example of two projects um, that we, one of them, one of which is called irradiated shade. So we've been developing what we call shade surplus and shade deficit and irradiated shade maps uh, of public spaces uh, using remote sensing and computational analysis to identify sites at particular risk of ultraviolet exposure. And we've been also developing computational workflows and representational strategies for assessing shade design from a scatter perspective. So um, put to kind of put this simply, um, in the desert, because there's particulate matter in the air that scatters UV at a sort of uh, higher rate and, and more density, and therefore when we're in shade in the desert, we are less protected than you're when you're under shade in any other place that doesn't have dust in the air. So mapping, uh, so how do, how do we measure this, right? Um, mapping for us starts with a focus on the area always near the, the, the international boundary where there's a high degree of pedestrian activity from travelers entering and leaving the US via pedestrian bridges that you see here, this kind of swoop um, on the river. And so the channelized Rio Grande Rio Bravo, um, which serves as the international boundary, um, you can kind of see the mid-rise core of downtown El Paso is at the top uh, kind of left um, of, the, of the image. And then the lower rise neighborhoods moving south into Ciudad Juarez. Uh, working in ArcGIS Pro um, for the sort of like urban level analysis using, using some built-in tools and more involved uh, processing workflows to extend what is essentially known and visible but uh, not yet mapped. So what we've been doing is using Landsat data that we can calculate the land surface temperature in midsummer, um, which is sort of the most brutal, and begins to describe the character of the space with increased heat island effects throughout the approach to the border and particular hotspots near the pedestrian bridges and transit connections near the port of entry. And then mapping diffuse solar radiation, we can see clearly unequal asymmetrical distribution of UV protection. Relatively low amounts of diffuse radiation are shown in the yellow tones, which you see here, mostly in the urban core and areas with high slope and high vegetation away from the border. But as you approach the border and the international bridges, um, exposure increases. These broad swaths of high exposure to diffuse radiation um, cover some of the lowest income zip codes in the city and in fact in the US, um, signaling access to urban UV protection as an under considered condition of environmental inequity. And then by running graphic and numeric overlays of the various base layers, we can begin to see some compound effects. You kind of have to squint with this one. Um, here, overlaying the land surface temperature and distance to transit maps, I guess you see it, um, you can see and calculate, we can see and calculate the areas that are generally hotter and in which pedestrians would have longer commutes. Overlaying the direct and diffuse radiation maps, we can better understand the need to design for changing concerns throughout a single urban corridor. 
using LIDAR point cloud data and GIS solar analysis tools, and we can better understand the distribution of the block level, revealing in this image areas of relatively high protection against diffuse radiation in the urban core. And then conditions of general overexposure along the streets approaching the bridges. Um, so this all seems incredibly dry but um, as content, but this, this information doesn't exist on the US-Mexico border, or if it does, it's not accessible to the public. And so we needed to build that kind of data context in order to understand how we might actually um, act or how we might be architects and designers in this context. So borrowing and some of these hidden logics of the mapping that were built into solar analysis that just simple GIS software has, We've also developed our own tools um, to visualize and assess these specific conditions at block level um, scale, um, moving to a more immediate kind of design and drawing environment. So this looks more familiar to us as architects. Uh, so to better understand the impact of building geometry actually at intersections or in any built uh, downtown area on UV exposure in urban space, we've developed this kind of spherical projection algorithm and um, that works with Rhino and Grasshopper. Each intersection yields a different and highly articulated sky exposure map, which we use it as a computable surface. Raw data from even the surface area, for instance, um, allows us to make quick assessments about the extent to which each intersection is exposed to diffuse radiation. From the images, we can better see which orientations have clear channels of exposure from ground to sky. You can kind of see the white uh, overlay on the orange here. Um, and so we have these two downtown um, digital models for Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, and we have run this kind of algorithm through every intersection and every public space where people might be waiting. Um, and then in order to make this a more kind of intuitive map, uh, we've unrolled the spherical projection in this kind of panorama drawing, allowing um, us and other designers in the city to see the particular geometry of the skyline clearly in every direction so that we can begin to assess and address these overexposed orientations. So from these assessments, we can see at much higher resolution than the kind of the Landsat aerial maps you saw earlier, the differences in exposure along the pedestrian corridors and can locate areas most in need of additional protection. This is our little eggshell catalog. Um, We've sampled every major pedestrian intersection of the borderland um, to create this kind of what we call a sky exposure catalog. And the reason for this is that the, the scatter UV damage that you, your body receive, receives is directly correlated to the amount of sky you see when you're under shade. And therefore the shape of the, the geometry of that sky is our, is our kind of design space. Um, so if we can color code these kind of um, these exposure areas, then we're able to have a, a different kind of mapping um, that addresses these sort of unseen uh, but felt kinds of inequities. And so how do we use this information? We have this map. Um, well, uh, there are many sort of governmental and non-governmental governmental associations that are um, coming to us for this research, and one of them is a nonprofit organization that runs uh, the Dinosaur Tracks site uh, in El Paso. The, the, the Dinosaur Tracks is a, an amazing archaeological um, site where I think it has the highest concentration of the most well-preserved dinosaur footprints in North America. And uh, there's a nonprofit organization that is stewards uh, is a steward of this, this territory, and they offer uh, free um, science classes to kids. But if you can imagine the desert, science classes usually happen in the summer outside of school hours, and um, you have to be out there at 5 a.m. Um, anytime after that is just way too hot and too damaging um, uh, for the kids. And so they came to us and they're, they're sort of challenging us with uh, taking all of this research and turning it into a, an outdoor classroom that would protect um, kids from UV exposure from scatter UV exposure. And so an outdoor classroom for very obvious reasons, right? We need to find the best way to span the most with the least amount of material um, and to kind of obviate all columns. And so we went to the reciprocal, the age old reciprocal frame um, and the reciprocal frame in El Paso and for the shade structure needs to be a surface rather than made of members. And so if, if we perceive of it as a surface that is bent that the short, um, the narrow members become structural and the other, the two kind of flat parts become um, shade. When they are aggregated together, they give us um, 
this kind of shade condition. And with material prices increasing um, by minute, we're uh, constrained to think about these maybe not as surfaces, but as assembled um, aggreg aggregations uh, at the small scale, assembled of parts, connections, and surfaces, essentially. So you generally would get a flat surface, but in order for the reciprocal frame to work, we'd have to rotate each member three to five degrees from its previous and its next, and you get this really gentle dome that could be self-supporting, but also um, shade well. So we've explored um, possible forms, as you see here, and understanding what is the most well-optimized material-wise, but that also can perform best um, against the, to protect against the sky exposure. So it's these, through these kind of UV and scatter analyses, we can even identify specifically at any time of the day and at any month of the year, um, which are the areas that protect the most against UV scatter. Um, this site is in a sort of like at the at the foothills of, of the, the dinosaur hills. Um, and through these kinds of really in-depth analyses, we've been able to optimize the shade structure and um, ended up on something like this that is buildable. Uh, but the idea is that um, because we are also the, the kind of the advocates for the project with a nonprofit, we've had to separate the project into um, into trades. So people who would do earthwork are at the at the kind of like bottom tier in the drawing, which is just retaining, and then people who would do who would donate the concrete. Uh, there's a manufacturer who's donating concrete, makes all of the seating accessible. So um, any seat can be accessed uh, by differently abled kids. And then we have a steel ring that could be fabricated somewhere and just shipped to site. And then the, um, the shade structure is made of pieces um, locally. And so even to just be able to sort of like separate in terms of donation pieces and how um, we might fundraise has been incredibly challenging, but we broke ground um, a few months ago and we start construction in, um, I was gonna say in January, but this is January so soon. <laughs> it's been January for months, so it's a, it's a thing I say. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's an incredibly challenging and a really um, a project that requires a lot of precision. So we'll see. We'll see how things will come together. Um, and this next project kind of contextualizes the air, um, the kind of binational air that we share. Uh, we call this atmospheric jurisdictions. Um, our work seeks to forge um, identities and promote dialogues across real and imagined boundaries. Another vector instrumental to our work here is the connection of transboundary atmospheres. A number of dynamic and often highly polluted airsheds uh, span the border, co-producing complex environmental effects with transboundary populations and binational urban centers. Our context is defined and controlled by layered jurisdictional borders. And you can even physically see here as layers of infrastructure where mineralized uh, infrastructures delineate local and regional areas while the atmosphere transgresses them. <laughs> Sorry, here's the wind. Um, the region has a dusty season. So our spring season is, is dusty, uh, which pushes particulate matter across these boundaries, problematizing environmental monitoring and endangering public health. So despite this shared air basin and the shared problems we face uh, with our neighbors, the jurisdictional fragmentation obscures the common issues in this urbanized valley. Atmospheric inversions, um, together with the colors of the high desert sunsets that you see here, make visible the ecological distress this region is suffering, creating conditions like these uh, that can last for days during the spring season. Atmospheric jurisdictions, like their terrestrial counterparts, are defined by borderlines. While some atmospheric administrative borderlines are drawn to coincide with, and therefore to reinforce, existing geopolitical constructs like national borders, others intentionally remap the territories below them. Our critical cartography of aerial territories reveals competing attitudes of contemporary airsheds to the jurisdictions they help to forge or subvert. So first, in order to start, we have to kind of look at the entire sort of uh, North American continent and we uncover, well, this is US and Mexico, but uh, we uncover an air monitoring regime uh, which reinforces the national bo borders. The travel of airborne particulate into and within the US has long been considered an existential threat to national security. Since 2003, under the BioWatch National Biosurveillance Program, 
Federal authorities in the US have enlisted air monitor stations in secretive locations, um, and they're not known to the public. And so moving down the scales, we explore the myriad multi-jurisdictional atmospheric administrative constructs with a national airspace, which assemble otherwise disjointed states and counties um, and different authorities in service of shared environmental action. As aerial territories consolidate and compound, they form entirely new geographies beyond the limits of traditionally conceived urban extents, creating what we can describe as airshed mega regions, forging new administrative and political um, collectives. So we've seen two fundamentally different geographies of atmospheric assessment, a subdivision of national airspace in order to reinforce a sovereign boundary and an aggregation of urbanized environments, which meets the border as an artificial limit. In the Paso del Norte region, which is where we are on the Mexico-US border, there are these two atmospheric constructs exist simultaneously, producing a hyperbolically atomized transnational air basin amidst significant environmental, urban, and demographic transformations. Our airshed spans and subverts the boundaries of multiple national, state, and binational jurisdictions in a complex patchwork. Environmental and atmospheric management in the Paso del Norte must contend with two countries, so US and Mexico, three states, New Mexico, Texas, and Chihuahua, and two cities, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. Asymmetries in reporting frequencies, in environmental standards and protocols, and systems of measurements at a number of these scales and levels of administration, you can imagine, yields divided, disjointed, and discontinuous data sets. Um, so this is also part of our context, uh, which is why um, so many maps in our work, we kind of have to build our own context. By extrapolating the range of the environmental sensors um, that are known and the sensor networks themselves, we can actually assess a density of monitoring and the scale of resolution that you see here. And we find significant disparities in investment and resolution throughout the urbanized borderland, which is a little bit darker and has smaller scale um, reach. And these become blind spots in the atmospheric sensing regime, leaving underrepresented atmospheres like ours that are really dusty and populations at risk beyond the gaze and focus of these monitors. And in our practice, um, well, Sergio's here, you've helped us. So, so there's a friend here who's helped us with these sensors. Um, we designed these kinds of really small, low resolution, totally inaccurate uh, design interventions because we're not scientists. But the idea is to address environmental justice issues and to kind of create an image of the issue uh, because we uh, this is all we can afford. So these are um, this is our extensive collection of Arduino based sensors and, a, and we've been installing them on both sides of the border um, in order to be able to collect uh, data and to develop our own sort of hyper localized data sets that lives um, at the block scale. So this is kind of how we've developed this, this drawing. Um, and, and in drawing our kind of binational region in terms of sheds, these are from eco regions that span the, the border uh, boundary. And this is what helps us kind of think of the shared issues. We are in the Chihuahua Desert, and El Paso is there in red, uh, which transgresses uh, the, the national boundary. But we're also a 40 minute drive from the Samalayuca uh, desert dunes, which are made of 100% silica, which means that during the dusty season, that really, really fine dust that you almost don't see um, travels really quickly, and it's uh, dangerous to lungs. And uh, the to kind of to, to give you an idea and to to make sure we're not exaggerating um, that the dusty season is actually visible through satellite, um, as you see here in purple. And rendering our region as such, where um, this kind of fossilized infrastructural and jurisdictional boundaries don't really make sense if particular matter makes this one enormous cloud. In conditions like these of under considered infrastructure and environmental neglect, uh, we get conditions like these, um, as I mentioned earlier, these kind of atmospheric inversions where essentially air, cold air is trapped um, and, and never sort of makes it out into the atmosphere. Uh, and this is a photo of Ciudad Juarez. And so we, uh, the, the Arduino sensors, this is kind of a, an older project, but it's an ongoing project because we've just resurrected it this year. Um, 
essentially looking at ubiquitous pieces of infrastructure that already exist, like uh, electrical junction boxes and camera surveillance camera bodies, and installing them in places where people volunteered their homes um, to hold the sensors for a given period of time, and um, kind of figuring out aerodynamics of how a camera monitor might be um, hacked and, and kind of outfitted with a dust sensor and um, kind of really trying to get at something like this, where on a digital model of the binational region and of the valley, we're able to layer the, the dust sensor monitors with um, wind data uh, and patterns that change over time to kind of understand um, the fluidity of this contest. So you can see this is not scientifically measurable information, but it's something that gives image to, um, to a, a shared, a shared concern and also has it has been really useful to talk to sort of lo local policymakers and activists um, as a way to kind of visualize this this condition. And uh, this is kind of the the current rendition. Uh, this drawing is a month or two old that we're 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 continuing to develop in order to kind of find all of the layers that render this valley that is shared um, so kind of um, uh, intentionally problematic to jurisdictional boundaries. This next project, we'll talk a little bit about vision. Um, this is a more recent project that we just installed at Exhibit Columbus, uh, which is kind of a, bi a biennial um, invited um, design installation. And um, this project doesn't have much to do with Columbus, uh, but it was right at the moment when we were really thinking about very specific issues of, of vision across the air. Uh, recent advances in, in multispectral imaging uh, technologies that are developed through military and security research have led to a widespread increase in the availability and use of affordable sensors, cameras, and handheld devices that are capable of detecting previously unseen and invisible um, conditions beyond the visible spectrum in urban environments. Spectral, which is what we call this, um, is a custom fabricated installation that deploys a matrix of infrared reflective material to shield a public space and its users from multispectral sensing by dis, um, distorting and camouflaging the image capture and image recognition capacity of aerial thermal imaging technologies. The installation is built with aluminum composite material, so a very simple ACM, you're probably familiar with it. Um, the thermal heat signatures that uh, move through ACM are undetectable in infrared photography which is a really convenient material. Just as designers of the built environment have developed expertise in designing for optical qualities of light and shadow, uh, we must now broaden our domain to include the provision of multispectral shadow. The installation is designed as a series of distorted reticular forms, uh, reticles like crosshairs that are, are horizontal and vertical registration marks. They're used for optical targeting and georeferencing by a number of optical devices, including aerial surveys using photogrammetry. And so for this installation, um, in order for it to complicate and confuse uh, such thermal and machine vision, the expected two-dimensional cruciform shape of the reticle is extruded into three-dimensional form, as you see here. And so the repeated appearance of similar reticular forms at multiple depths problematizes the dimensional registration of the form. Firms are each built from two, two central panels that kind of friction fit with each other. They're CNC routed, slotted together and bolted to four side panels. And they're designed to nest tightly on standard four by eight sheets, maximizing the protective uh, volume while minimizing material waste. Uh, using this kind of flat pack approach, uh, they're just ACM uh, sheets scored, CNC scored. The parts can easily stack in minimal volume for ease of shipping before and after installation. The idea for this is that it is easily replicatable, shippable, and installable by anyone. And so here we are. Uh, the, the two of us are, are installing this. So because we're unskilled laborers, uh, part of the, the prep of the design work is such that anyone can build it. You see here like this kind of medieval jig on the left that we made on site in order to fold. Um, and the pre-cut holes and the anchors help make the assembly super easy. Um, the folded nesting base detail that you see here, uh, they're steel plates. They um, help speed up the assembly time as parts could easily slip and lock into place. Our small team uh, completed this in just a few days, um, and 
this is part of the, the hope that these are easily deployable and easily installable. And then uh, obviously budgets or constraints uh, of, of budgets and material um, availability is, is those are real concerns. So to achieve maximum effect, um, the repetitive array uh, achieves a high degree of optical variety within the economy of, of the discrete parts. The project is constructed in six bundles in this kind of urban alley, uh, uses a pedestrian passageway and a site for public events. So from the street, the bundles appear as a continuous wall as you're walking around them. Uh, the idea is to shield pedestrians from the street while also providing this kind of visual backdrop for their events, for their exhibitions. The target-like forms are designed to simultaneously address and manipulate several different vantage points from which aerial optical technologies typically capture images of urban forms. From the overhead and plan view, typical of satellite photography, the forms appear as a grid of targets. But from the oblique view, typical of aerial drone photography, the broad sides of the forms block vision and create multispectral shadow. And then from the ground level, the forms reveal this kind of layered inner and outer construction with varying optical and thermal characteristics. At night, there's a, there's a, an LED array that's installed in order to kind of magnify their presence and, and cast these shadows in the background, but it also became a background for thermal events, uh, so it's AKA parties, but uh, the idea was to be able to kind of test um, in, uh, these thermal kinds of activities by gathering um, warm bodies against the ACM and testing it through this vision. So using some of the same ubiquitous handheld thermal imaging technologies, we're able to see how the piece impacts this mul the multispectral city, creating this kind of safe space for individual and collective signatures, the heat signatures of bodies, beyond the detection of multispectral surveillance was really important to us. Um, so this really short project uh, has supported a much larger kind of writing and research project that looks at the signatures of a city and what does this actually mean uh, for the future of design. So different cities emit different types of multispectral signatures that impact how we make decisions about materials. Um, and I will end on sort of moving on, uh, moving, sort of zooming out uh, from these smaller scales of projects to the global scale with uh, a short excerpt of the book um, that Alvin briefly mentioned. Uh, here it is. So from the kind of hyper-local issues that you saw, right, the question for us always, always is how do we scale up and why is this relevant? beyond where we live. Um, and so this is, the book covers a, a global scale. Um, it was published two years ago and collects original research, writing, mappings, and speculative drawings concerning the many fronts we see impacting global cities. The research compiled in the book hopes to eliminate the pervasive, securocratic condition of the contemporary city where life is simulated and governed by the spatial mechanisms and byproducts of an expanding, <laughs> anti-urban global war. The US military through its ubiquitous construction and reconstruction efforts around the globe has produced a vast geography of urban simulation that endeavors to shape both the reality of urban violence and a violent urban imaginary targeting the global city as ground zero for next generation warfare. A coordinated military training apparatus strategically deploys repeated types and tropes of the developing world, uh, developing here is in quotes, um, uh, developing world city to prepare for the efficient delivery of lethal force in informal contexts, while simultaneously engaging in planning and nation building efforts that seek to suppress their spread. While conducting the research for the book, we found and visited a number of these simulated cities that uses urban warfare training sites cataloging their forms and materiality. And this is how we landed in El Paso. We were passing through to finish the research on the book. And then seven and a half years later, we're still there. <laughs> Fronts, uh, we suggest, as we suggest in the book, are different kinds of global transnational spaces. They're new constellations of cities and urban patterns developed from the agonistic interchange of security and development pressures. Although its constituent parts may be geographically distant, the front is bound and shaped by a set of common characteristics. A front is a type of securocratic frontier. A front remaps territories, crosses borders, creates pockets of space beyond international law. A front 
enables the production of new forms of emergency space, developing offensive and defensive urban typologies in a type of reciprocal architectural arms race. A front is a site of tension, a loose and ever evolving boundary between these fields of productive difference. A front inhabits the line between extra legal and criminal, between individual security and national security. A front is a balancing act rapidly approaching a tipping point. The future of the front is of equal and immense interest to the military industrial complex, the urbanizing poor, and the policymakers, organizers, planners, designers, and interventionists who find themselves increasingly drawn to the front in order to reshape it. By, by identifying these sites and in naming them fronts, we hope to encourage multiple readings of these emerging urban forms and their attendant logics. Fronts are militaristic. The, front, the fronts represent sites of future struggles over the nature of informal city life. In this sense, the multiple geographies indexed by the book represent front lines or vanguards between the often opposing forces of security and development. They are epicenters in which the interests of the so-called developed and the so-called developing worlds collide. Conceived as next generation military battlegrounds, they are already the contemporary battlegrounds for social equity and spatial justice. Fronts are disingenuous. The fronts are manifest both in real space and in the covert sites that simulate them. In this mirror duality, secrecy and subterfuge play important roles. The definition of space is conjoined with obf obfuscation. In that sense, the fronts uncover a duplicitous urban narrative populated by a series of cover stories, false flags, double agents, feints, and disguise. Fronts are meteorological. The fronts argue for an emerging meteorologic urbanism in which cities are increasingly recast as a pointillistic assemblage of autonomous structures of governance, irrespective of the jurisdictional and juridical boundaries of the nation state. The constellation of city types presented in the maps in the book and texts suggest urban identities are becoming fluid, presented as thickened zones of volatility and innovation, destabilized amidst an ever-shifting backdrop of conflict resource, uh, conflict, resource deplet depletion and migration. As military logisticians confirm, cities now operate as independent agents, free from the political structures and sovereign governments whose borders would once have them obtain, contained. Um, and quickly to describe this message, this is Playas in New Mexico, uh, very close to where we are. And you can see uh, this was a former copper mining town. So these are all um, suburban American homes and, and streets. And when the copper um, mining ended, uh, everyone abandoned the town. And so now it is owned by New Mexico Tech, which is a sort of a weapons testing um, program. And they rented out to the Department of Defense for uh, simulated training. And so the, the suburban homes have become, let me see if I can point down here. Can you, oh, you can see my pointer. Um, so the suburban homes, their side yards now are built up with uh, specifically, this is a uh, North African village that's being simulated for um, urban warfare. And so there's an entire kind of like other set of write writings and research about that. Um, for our simulated cities database, we uncovered 500 of these sites that we, we as civilians have been able to find. We use publicly available data to uncover this hidden geography um, essentially, we scraped government contracts, congressional hearings, uh, voting on budgetary appropriations, military construction documents, and kind of cross-referenced and geolocated them, um, and journalistic sources. So this is the first uh, public geolocated database of these secretive sites, and it shows the extent of its spread in the U.S. and beyond. It also demonstrates the diversity of the sites and increasing specialization within the sites as a new kind of urban form. Here is a look at the spread just within the US. You can see various types and clusters geographically distributed. Most military installations will have at least one site and many will have several. Some installations specialize in constructing and training in this type of environment, constructing multiple simulated cities and running operations between them within the base uh, boundaries kind of to simulate a small country. And then training operations also spread throughout the constellation of sites with some training operations moving across multiple states and neighboring bases. Um, and this is what also supported some of the conspiracy theories uh, 
Chuck Norris and people like that, because there was a multiple state training scenario that um, they were saying the government was there to take their weapons. Um, the sites where the everyday and the domestic environments of the city are duplicated telegraph the sites of future war. Violent conflict, the sites tell us, will increasingly enter the city and our most private spaces. So we begin with an introductory chapter detailing emerging concepts of global insecurity and emerging forms of urban life, which will inform um, the entire book's investigation. Through the lens of urban simulation, we explore shifting attitudes towards density and informality that are mapped onto a series of remote sites used for urban warfare simulation. We include a detailed history of simulated urban environments used by the world's militaries since before World War I. But most importantly, we discuss this emerging type that we're interested in, the Combined Arms Collective Training Facility, or um, as they say, CACTF for short. This is the new gold standard of simulated urbanism. Let's see. This, this typology mandates the replication of certain urban and architectural typologies to provide an authentically challenging training environment to prepare for counterinsurgency. We've located over 30 of these specific types uh, of facilities and can learn a lot about the military's posture towards urban environments from deep analysis of their architectural and urban forms. Then uh, we, we kind of uh, separate these findings into three sections. Each details an emerging front, an urban geography in which the interests of informal development and global security collide to produce new urban forms, the proto-city, the logistic city, and the carceral city. The fronts are selected as part of a continuum of urban developments from nascent securocratic constructions to revisionist interventions in more established cities. They range from the emerging proto-cities and city camps that punctuate the geographies of humanitarian government to existing cities infiltrated and transformed by the pressures of militarized planning and migrating populations respectively. The fronts are presented as test cases, dispatches from the frontier of international development, sketches of an emerging world order. Included in the book are both cautionary tales and informative benchmarks for informal urban life under the spreading domain of global security. Each front poses unique challenges and opportunities for shaping the cities of the new millennium. I think this is, oh, sorry. This is the one that I have to make everything play. <laughs> each section is divided into two chapters with each chapter focusing on a spatial typology within the front, drawing from examples of emerging military training typologies related directly to the front um, and the effects of militarization on existing developing cities. We unpack the ways in which the front is spatially manifest, echoing doctrinal conceptions of space for military encounters. Chapters use case studies to outline the relationship between forces of global security and urban development and present alternative practices that work actively in the production of space in the securocratic frontier, exploiting the gaps within global security. The chapters together present these six spatial types that you see here, or rather existing spatial types that have been radically reimagined and reconstructed under the contemporary security apparatus. The camp, the zone, the dump, the graveyard, the squat, and the jail. Examples of subversive uh, quote unquote tactics act as counterpoints to the growing hegemony of these securocratic types and are presented um, at the end of each chapter. Let's see if I can. So identifying repeating typologies, and in many cases, identical replicas, um, we're understanding what the requirements are for this type of training. So the, this specific typology, the CACTF, requires over 30 buildings of various types um, and excerpts of different forms of urbanism and urban occupation. Um, so generally, they require an embassy, a city hall, a police station, a jail, tunnels, bridges, and other types of infrastructures. And the types that are deployed in these spaces are typically include what they call in quotes, a shanty town, effectively criminalizing self-built environments and casting them as inherently suspect. The book details the military's aversion to false fronts or to postmodernism, and considers military planning as an alternate architecture and urban history. 
planners, uh, military planners, study typical construction patterns like curtain walls and box wall construction in order to discern if and how a building might be best used or weaponized. So the false facade and the false front um, the, is really something that confuses their the legibility of a building and therefore um, offers difficulties to the military. Disingenuous facades might obscure the inner structure of the material honesty, problematizing the military's ability to use a building as cover, concealment, or an embattlement for certain types of weapons. Military planners profess, um, this is a quote, the true character of the building can be seen always from the rear. So as we've seen, this is my last slide, <laughs> a large number of secretive urban simulation sites have propagated and evolved over the last several decades. All signs suggest the shadow urbanism will only continue to spread. These sites are more than just a collection of urban simulacra. They are spatial mechanisms for exerting state power. From this position on the simulated sites, a militaristic viewpoint of our collective urban futures is continuously absorbed, rehearsed, and ingrained, threatening to project back into the world and shape cities in its image. However, in the book, we hope that another city is possible. Thank you.